So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session. Um, I think probably it's already becoming quite a lot of intensity. People have seen a lot, had a lot of input. Um, so hopefully we'll keep you awake. We have a really interesting hour ahead of us. And this is going to be on the history of infectious disease pandemics in Europe. What are the lessons for prevention and control measures? If we can have the first slide. No, no, that wasn't the first slide. Okay. No. There we are. Okay, thank you. So, I actually shouldn't be standing here at all. Um, my name is John Kinsman. I work at ECDC as an expert in social and behavior change, um, but I was not originally slated to be standing here. This session was actually designed by a man called John Paget, who surely many of you know, um, and he, he was the brainchild behind it. He's the one who came up with the idea and got all of the colleagues involved who are going to be speaking today. And very sadly, he died earlier this month unexpectedly. And so I was asked to step in. So um, he was an epidemiologist, but I had worked with him last year at Escaida and the previous year at Escaida organizing social science sessions. So in that sense, he was a very special sort of epidemiologist. He understood the importance of social science for epidemiology. And this, this session really is uh, at least one small tribute to John, who was a, a cheerful, good-hearted, and wonderful man. Uh, in a moment, Lone is going to give some reflections about him. But first, I would like to introduce the speakers. Um, it says here, actually incorrectly, that we have Donatelli, uh, who is going to speak about the plague. But in fact, we have Severia Kaini, who is going to take her place on this one. And he's going to talk about how the plague devastated Florence and Siena in the 14th century. And Saviera is with the, uh, the Netherlands Institute for Health Services Research, NIVEL. We're then going to move forward to the Spanish influenza outbreak in 1918-1919, or to 1920. Um, and Peter Sproevenberg from NIVEL also is going to talk about that. And he's going to talk about the impact of the, the pandemic on mortality. And then we fast forward another 100 years to COVID and SARS-CoV-2. And Loni Simonsson from Roskilde University in Denmark is going to talk about Europe's response to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And then we have something, a slightly different take on things. We have uh, John Bilbatua, who is also from ECDC, and he's going to give us a sort of history of EI, epidemi epidemiological intelligence activities in Europe. So first of all, we're looking at the pandemics themselves, and then we're going to look and see how we've actually tried to understand these through EI activities. So with that, I'm going to call on Lone. Please, if you would like to just give us uh, a couple of moments of your thoughts on John. So yes, John, that... thank you very much. It's, uh, do you hear me well? Yes, we hear you. We yeah, don't see I, you, though. Yes, Is it possible to get Lone on the screen? I also don't see the photo of John. Okay, there so we go. I don't thank know you. how I'm connected. So um, I'm here in uh, in Denmark, and uh, an old colleague and friends of John's, and I and I, s I have said I would uh, try to speak a few words here. Um, as you know, he died unexpectedly on uh, November 4th, and is survived by Dineke, his wife, and his children, um, and his close friends. We know he worked and and made a tremendous impact in in respiratory diseases epidemiology in surveillance systems across Europe and uh, making global networks that uh, especially in influenza and RSV and uh, if you are interested in in contributing your own memorial or to um, contribute to to uh, in some ways you can go on the nivel side and there's a there's a place to do so um, so for me, I've had the pleasure of working with John for many years and on several projects and, and spent time at Nibble and uh, in Holland for that reason. Uh, most, most intensely perhaps was our work uh, to raise up a global modeling collaboration to figure out the, the global mortality in the 2009 H1N1 PDM uh, influenza pandemic. And I have checked in with uh, my colleagues at the NIH and uh, at Sage Analytica in the US, and they all remember our years with John and uh, the projects that we called Glamour and IPIA in the same way. We remember his kindness, his enthusiasm, that he was well liked, that he was collaborative, that he had the best smile, 
and that he was masterful at making people from different fields work together well and be happy sharing their data and insights. And he was engaging, easygoing, a good epidemiologist, a pragmatic person who could make projects work out. Really a mastermind of wild and memorable acronyms for our scientific endeavors together as well. And then again, we spoke here in October, this is almost 10 years later, uh, planning this, work site, this uh, workshop in SK, which is really his uh, brainchild. He also was very interested in historical epidemiology and this interest we shared. And it was like no time had passed. He just looked like the way he always does. And, and it was so good to see him again. And um, so I wanted to also share some words that uh, came of remembrance from some of his other uh, close colleagues and friends in Europe that I found on the Nivel side. There's one from Carolyn Brown from uh, the European WHO. Um, I'll remember John as a kind, friendly and happy person. In the 15 years that we worked together, he never lost his enthusiasm, interest and curiosity. I have fond memories of the many networks, meetings and trainings that we organized together. The flu network in Europe is unthinkable without him. He will be sure, sorely missed. So sorry he had passed too early. My thoughts are with his family. And Thea Kølsen Fischer, uh, my colleague here in Denmark and uh, uh, at the North Zealand Hospital, we have lost a wonderful colleague and a personal good friend. I have shared so many good and fun moments, collaborations and friendships with John uh, over the year, last 10 years when we met in our shared interest in respiratory viruses. I have followed the path of his beloved family, and I think I speak on behalf of many when I say that an intellectual, sharper, yet kind and humble man is hard to find. John, you are already missed by us all. And on behalf of the Danish Rescue Promise team and from myself personally, Tia. And I just want to conclude with that in, in the honor of John, I think we should all acknowledge that life can be unexpectedly and unfairly short. And this is why we must make the most of every day. We must be our best. We must be kind, collaborative, effective, enthusiastic, human, and have fun at it too. And I think we should start with this uh, SK session in his honor. Thank you so much, Lone. That's beautiful. Very much appreciated. Okay, so let's now start. Um, Severio, I'm going to ask you to come forward um, on the screen here and present about the plague in Florence and Siena. So this, the floor is yours. Yes. So um, thank you. Um, this presentation, as the, the as you can see, was prepared um, mostly by Donatella Lippi. Uh, who is a professor of history of medicine at the University of Florence. I helped her and then in the end she, she couldn't make it, so I'm presenting on her behalf. Um, uh, today I will talk about the plague more mostly from a historical point of view, speaking in the past sense, tense. And to make the story more um, current, we decided to let Giovanni Boccaccio speak, who actually experienced the plague of uh, 14th century. He was uh, 25 at the time and told us about it uh, in his masterpiece, the, the Cameron. There, Boccaccio frames the problem as the protagonist, and he begins the story by enumerating the, the causes of the plague, both natural and supernatural, adding that the plague uh, came from the East, as far as he knew. and and Indeed, uh, from the from the east it came because the plague of uh, 1348 beca began in Crimea, um, which is also today on on newspapers for different but equally tragic um, reasons. So in Crimea, the city of Kaffa was the last stronghold of Genoa, where all grain supplies for Europe came from. Tamerlan had placed Kaffa under siege, but at some point he was forced to withdraw his army when the plague broke out among his soldiers. However, before leaving, he threw the corpses of the plague victims with a catapult into the walls of Kaffa, and when the ships set sail to export grain from, from, from Ukraine to Europe, they spread the plague throughout Europe. It was so one of the first known cases of biological uh, warfare. Um, in, in Florence, um, when a case of plague was, was reported, uh, and this is one of the 
say, uh, initial similarities that you can see between plague of the time and COVID, special officials were first appointed and silence was maintained on the news. Later on, when the news became uh, public knowledge, the bell rang to raise the alarm and guards were placed at the city gates. Um, the plague usually came from the north um, in, to, to Florence, so Florence sent uh, um, troops to patrol the mountain passes and travelers without valid health cards were arrested and imprisoned very much like uh, what well, they were in prison at the beginning of the COVID, but you, you see the similarity. And very often these passports were forged with vinegar and other methods. In the early, it was impossible to keep watch. And so anti-plague hospitals were set up to quarantine the sick. Straw mattresses were burned, sheets were burned, uh, and the houses of the infected were cleaned and fumigated. Um, later on in his masterpiece, Boccaccio describes the symptoms of the disease, which mostly manifested itself with very painful and fatigue dark uh, bubbles. Um, since no um, remedy uh, could work, it was difficult to understand the cause of the plague. So foreigners, the poor, and everybody who was different was often blamed. Uh, the rich blamed the poor, the poor blamed the rich, and the church identified the cause in these solid customs and invited people to pray and flagellate themselves, as you can see in this, in this il illustration. Despite all of this, disease transmission was practically unstoppable and doctors were not sure what disease they were fight fighting against. Um, transmission at the time was believed to occur through an invisible, an invisible fetid odor emanating from contaminated uh, places and people. And um, this is why the, the plague doctors wore their terrifying protective clothes. Again, something that we have seen very recently, although with, of course, <laughs> differences. And the locked beaked mask, full of aromatic substances, can counteract the effect of miasmas, the gloves, and so on. Uh, the only practical way to survive and not to get infected by, by the plague was to escape and to live in isolation. Again, something that we have all experienced. This is what the protagonist of the Cameron did as they spent their time telling uh, stories to each other, probably in, in, a, in a situation that was not as idyllic as we see in this, in this um, picture. Um, the, in the reality was that the bodies were buried at night in huge pits the, since there was not consecrated land in sufficient extent to provide graves and uh, everybody that comes from, from Italy at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic in northern Italy remembered the long line of trucks carrying the, the dead people away from, from Bergamo, the city in northern Italy that was hit first. When the, uh, the state of epidemic was declared, declared, the city died. Sounds of daily life could no longer be heard. The workshops were closed and people were forced to stay indoors. Again, people were forced to stay indoors. Uh, Florence at, uh, at night in this period, while well, the city was immersed in darkness, fires were lit at crossroads to purify the air. Every now and then you could hear the bell announcing people taking away the dead. Uh, the population of the, the cities was halved and only those who had managed to escape were saved. If you look at, this, at these figures, you see that this is the number of uh, of deaths, estimated number of deaths due to the Black Deaths in, in cities in Europe. And for instance, you, you see that in Siena, there were around estimated 70,000 um, uh, deaths, cons considered that the population of Siena nowadays is around 50,000. So it's it's more people died during the Black Plague in Siena, that is the, the, the population of, of, of today. And this is uh, um, something that perhaps if you have visited the city, you, you know, the project for the new cathedral, there is a nice cathedral in Siena, but the, few, the, the project for a new and much a larger cathedral was not completed precisely because there, wa there was no longer the population who could have used it. And of course, also there was no uh, workforce. 
So uh, doctors could only give advice uh, to prevent the plague. Um, there were several publications, um, mostly written in vernacular, since the, um, they wanted to everyone to be able to understand it. Um, um, for for the treatment of plague, very uh, often um, there were uh, what was recommended were traditional anti-plague pills and other and other um, and other medications. But again, other measures that were recommended were hand washing, distancing, advice not to touch objects uh, touched by sick people. So. Um, Authors of this of this book uh, very often stated that no one should not believe that someone who got sick once will never get sick again. So in the end, um, the Black Death uh, spread across Europe in several ways, causing death and poverty. So much so that today the word plague is also used in a metaphorical sense uh, to indicate a tragic situation against which it is difficult to find a remedy. And it's uh, while preparing uh, this, 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 this presentation, we were really impressed by the number of um, similarities that between what happened at the time when very little was known about, of course, uh, uh, causes of infectious diseases and way to fight against them and what has happened only three years ago to prevent um, to prevent COVID more than five centuries later. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Saviero. It's absolutely fascinating and quite chilling, I think you can say to think about what the people in that time went through in the face of knowing so little about what they were dealing with. And yet they did actually understand that it, that it was infectious. That was clear. Um, they did understand that distancing from other people was a way to uh, protect themselves. So there were certain sort of quite interesting similarities. Um, and also what I think is interesting, in the, if you look at the stigmatization, which we've also seen, as you said, it was the foreigners or the, or the rich or the poor, whoever they were, there was always someone else who was to blame, which is another quite common characteristic in outbreaks. Um, so that those are the basic human elements which cut across from then to now. I think we've seen the same. I'm just wondering, in terms of something more altruistic and positive, a quick question to you. I'm thinking about the village of Ayam in the north of England, which you may have heard of. It's a village that cut itself off from the rest of the world during the Black Plague. And uh, the people refused to go out and nobody came in. And so there was a very high mortality inside the village, um, but they did protect the surrounding area. Were there any examples that you can think of, of this sort of altruism in the Florence area during the Black Plague? Yes, yes, indeed, there is a um, there is a small uh, town which is uh, around um, say twenty kilometers from Florence, and something very similar happened. Actually, there is a, a book written which I recommend to everybody, uh, uh, anyone who is interested in these topics. Um, the the name of this uh, small village was is Montelupo, which means uh, Wolf Mount. And, um, and something very similar happened. There's a nice story um, told in this book. I, I can I can I can provide details in the chat if if anybody interested. And basically, there was uh, pretty much I mean quite similar to to what happened in the in the village in in, in England. There were um, basically uh, people patrolling the, the 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 walls of the of the village and uh, and trying to. To, 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 to stop uh, um, passage of people and then and then yeah that that is also in terms of altruism I mean it I, I really recommend um, reading this book is written by it's fascinating written by a well-known uh, um, historian of medicine so um, yeah anyway th there were examples of I mean similar to, to what happened in, in England of course yeah. Thanks. And again, again, that's fascinating because this, there was no communication between England and the rest of these and, and Florence. Yeah. So this was, again, a human response, which I, th I find quite fascinating. It was not culturally contextualized or specific. It was something that people did because they felt it was the right thing to do. So that's fascinating. Thank you very much, Saviero. Very interesting. We're going to move now to Peter Spravenberg, who's going to talk about the 1918 pandemic. So, Peter, over to you. OK.
just waiting for the slides. We have it on the screen. It's okay. Uh, okay. Yes, now I can see him also. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, an attempt to estimate the global mortality burden during the 1980 flu pandemic. And for anybody interested in it, it's you can read it in the uh, both mentioned articles in the Journal of American Epidemiology. Please, next slide. Well, something about the background. One of the interesting things about when you go through the literature after 1980 that tries to get, make an estimate of how many people died, that the further you go in time, the larger the numbers become. And that's always an intriguing thing, because that's what you see with many epidemiological studies. It's always worse. And one question, of course, is, is it correct? OK, next slide. Well, to do an, est an estimate, you have to have something. And first of all, you have to have a sample of country specific population and mortality data. And that's observed data. And these data we took from the human mortality database, which is based on national registries from those years. And well, one of the nice things is that the, the best estimates you can get or data for the population and mortality, it's used for calculating life tables. Next thing is that you have to develop an analysis strategy. How do I go on and measure the measure uh, the burden measurement? Next is the estimation that you're going to do. You're going to do probably do a model and uh, because you want to try to correct for some things. And the last thing, and I think it's the most important one, trying to validate what you found. And for that, we don't look only at data, but we go try to go back to reality also. Next slide, please. These are the countries that are in the human mortality database. As you see, mostly European countries that have data for this period, but also New Zealand, and that's without the Maori, the indigenous people from New Zealand. Next slide. But what, what about India? Because what you read in the literature is that it was far worse in India and so forth. And from that, I used data from the British government. They make every year an extensive report. We have lots of uh, local numbers and it resembles something of a national registry. Next slide. Well, estimating the mortality, I used developed three methods. And the basic is what you do is you look for 1918 and 1919 and you compare that to reference years. And reference years are chosen here as 1916, 1917, 1920, and 1921. So two years before and two years after the period. One way is what you can do is, well, you look at the difference between the average of those four reference years. It has its advantages and its disadvantages, but there is also a second method, and that's what I call the maximum estimate. And then you choose the lowest value of the reference years. What you're doing more or less is saying, well, I try to maximize the difference. So I try to maximize a burden. And the third one, that's the minimum one. And then you choose the highest 
value in the reference years, but that a value that should be below the year that you are interested in, so below 1918, because otherwise you would end up with negative burdens, and that's something that's doubtful. Of these differences, well, we do, we do it by age groups, five-year age groups, I've done it. It's also one of the nice things about the human mortality database that it is. Uh, Age-specific data, so you can do it very refined. And next, you uh, go to, or what I use is also rates, and that's a kind of relative number. And from this relative number, you go back to the absolute numbers. And negative excess, I have changed to zeros. Next slide. OK, this is a simple observation of this, which means that, well, the minimum, the maximum, that's what you find in nine, if you compare it to 1917, because that had the lowest value, and the minimum one you find use 1920, which is more close. Next slide. Uh, to do the calculations, I used the multi-level model. I won't go deep into it, but what you use is an estimate. You estimate for the reference years and the pandemic years, an average in the model and the difference between the two, that's your burden. And you do it all by age class. Next. Well, what the first one is simply where you look at the human mortality data. So I ignored India for the moment. And when you do those calculations, <coughs> well, I compared simple direct calculations, not using a model, then model based in the model next model I corrected for if uh, countries were at war at that moment, especially World War I, but also countries like, for instance, Finland, that was in a very serious war with Russia and in a civil war at that moment. And next, I also corrected for a time trend, because what you often see in these data Populations uh, grow uh, the following a certain trend upwards or even downwards. And what's important here is that you see in all these models, the more you try to correct and control for what is happening and what may introduce bias, the lower the numbers get. And where you end up with is there something around 10 million. Next slide. Here I introduced India, the data from India, and they were in general some sixfold for higher than in Europe. And they also did the calculation, and you see that the numbers go up extensively if corrected for all these factors. They go down, and then you end up with something around, depending on which model you would choose between 15 and 19 million. Next slide. Next, what you're gonna try to do is, well, how can I figure out, is it, is it reasonable what I've done? Is it a reasonable estimate of what might have happened in the world? The first thing I did was simply do simulations. And what simulations mean is that, well, you let software make up data. And then you do calculations and see what happens. The first three upper figures are closely related. What I've shown there is that we have uh, an average country rate of 900 deaths per 100,000, and we use approximately 200 countries in the world. And what they have is then, 
with a certain standard deviation. That's 250 was chosen. So the world rate would be 900 deaths per 100,000. And if you do the calculation, what you see is that you end up with something around 17.4 million. What you get is a very small peak distribution of all these countries from the simulated data. And what's immediately clear is that India is, is an extreme outlier. Well, one, if you would change your uncertainty of how similar the deaths in all the countries would be, well, then you increase the standard deviation. The variance be between countries becomes bigger. And that's what's done in the second one. We go from 250 to 750. What should be noted is that the mortality rate stays the same, total mortality stays the same, but what you see, it's become more wider, the distribution, so the differences between countries are much bigger. And in the third one, we go up to 150, and then you see a very flat distribution with very uh, large outliers or going in the high and low directions, which would mean that there is an enormous differences between countries. Well, if we look at literature and try to figure out what happened in the world, well, we don't expect to be that extreme differences between countries. In the following five graphs, I changed more importantly, how many countries had a death rate similar to Europe, which is around 500. In the first graph, I chose 168 countries having this mortality rate. And in 23 or 33 countries have a mortality rate similar to India. That's 3,000. Well, what's immediately clear, you get two peaked distribution. And well, you should ask yourself is this is a correct description of what happened in the world, which would mean that we had two groups of countries. Most countries in a lower mortality rate and a few countries in a higher mortality rate. And then you would end up with the same total amount of 17.4 million. In the next one, we changed it a little. 135 countries having a European mortality rate and 65 an India mortality rate. So that would mean more or less two thirds are European like and one third of the countries are India like. Still, you have the two peaks. And what's important, the total mortality would go up to 24 million people. If you would say half of the countries are European like and half of the countries are India like, that's the third one, then you would go up to 33 million. And of course, always the mortality, the world mortality rate would also go up. In the next uh, mortality figure, it's we changed it that most countries would look more like India, two thirds roughly, and one third would look like Europe. So more now Europe becomes more like the outlier. Well, if you then do the calculations, the rate goes up to 2250 and the total mortality goes up to 43.4. Well, if you heard very often in the literature nowadays that it should be something around 50 million deaths in the 1980 pandemic. Well, if you base it on these uh, liter on this data, you need 20 countries having a European-like mortality and the rest of the world should all look like India. And 
that's something well you can ask yourself is that what you find in the literature and actually if you go in the literature and also in the historical literature it's very unlikely peter i'm going to ask you kindly to to come to an end if i may thanks yeah yes do the next slide but this is just to see how you can play with data to give you an idea of what might be possible well for india if you look at the literature there's a interesting thing going on there's an extreme difference between the west and the east of india in the western part they had these high mortality rates and the further you go from west to east the lower it gets and the mortality total mortality rate becomes more similar like europe another thing that's strange is that the mortality rate is not highest in the middle age group, but in the infants. So that suggests all something else might be going on there. Well, there's a nice example in the literature where tra somebody tries to estimate the mortality rate for Indonesia. And it's a country with 40 million. And he came to the conclusion that 4 million of the Indonesians had died. That's 10% of a population. Well, if that happens, that would mean that in the following years, the total population would be lower. And that's not what is happening. And what is also interesting is to see that in all the reports, everybody was surprised by how rapid it went through the total countries, affecting everybody. There was no difference between the old being affected, between older, younger, richer, poor. It was everywhere. Next slide. And well, now come I to my end. And this was done in the memory of John, who inspired this study and was a very close friend of mine. Thank you very much, Peter. I just want to ask one very brief question to you. This is obviously a very elaborate uh, post hoc uh, recalculation of the mortality rates. Do you think, therefore, that other pandemics or outbreaks have also suffered from sort of systematic miscounting? And would some uh, retrospective reanalysis give us a better sense? Or do you think that this is an, an outlier in the sense that most, most outbreaks, we kind of have a pretty good idea of what mortality was? Just a brief response to that. Uh, on the world scale, well, one of the things that I look at COVID, uh, everybody always wants to see more deaths. Yes, there should be always in every article you read, well, we underreported, this is underreported, we undercalculated or whatever. But nobody asks him the question, well, what can I learn from what actually happened? And if you want to look at, I've done the same in the article for the other flu pandemics in the 20th century did the calculation and what I also found is that or found is that the close the people who were close to the year that the pandemic happened often give the best estimates okay thank you very much indeed Peter we're yep. going to move on now to Lone who's going to talk us about Europe's response to SARS-CoV-2. Lone, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, except the slides disappeared for me and my ability to take over the presentation has gone just uh, about two minutes ago. Okay, no. we, can, we can see the slide here. Um, I don't know if you want to just say next slide, please, if you don't have the uh, that, I don't. Yourself. I don't see them at all. I don't see any slides anywhere. Okay, we do. Yeah, okay, <laughs> now we now I see that. <laughs> so let me a guess a slide. It took a, moment to come it took a moment to come through for Peter, so perhaps it will come through for you. 
Sorry. Okay, uh, now I so now I have to tell you to change the slides. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to uh, tell you about um, our experience with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in Europe. What lessons can be drawn today? And uh, I have studied historical pandemics for uh, what 30 years of my career, and it's always been an, a great interest for me. Here was a chance to really study one in real time, and suddenly there was funding for it. So the next slide, please. The next slide. I don't see the next slide. No, oh, there it is. This is just to show you that in, in Denmark now we have a big pandemic uh, research, uh, basic research center that will go the next 10 years. And we are uh, researchers from several universities with collaborators from around the world trying to really um, understand uh, what is going on. Now I'm going to take the control. I have a chance now. Um, oh, shouldn't have done that, huh? Sorry about that. I thought I could just hop right in. Please bear with me till I get to my uh, slides here. Yeah, so that was the center and uh, it's really our idea to study every aspect of pandemics ranging from how they are born, where they come from, all the way to how do they end and whatever can we do about it. And it's a very interdisciplinary endeavor. We have uh, historians, we have physicists, modelers, uh, mathematicians, bioinformatics. We work with data people. We are all over the place with this, trying to really ask any question that will bring us closer to understanding the phenomenon of pandemics. So uh, if we think back in time for March, um, really February, March 2020, Europe was taken completely by surprise by this pandemic. Uh, especially uh, we were shocked when the way Lomb Lombardy was hit in northern Italy and really it was a great um, and very very sad lesson on what could have become uh, of any what could have happened to any uh, large city in Europe at the time and really uh, the soccer match that kicked off Italy's uh, coronavirus disaster in the end of February uh, led to 60% of people just in Bergamo city, a city like, like uh, Copenhagen, any big city, um, that actually 60% of the population had been affected very soon. So it just goes to show this is this was something very real. It was a hundred years event and, and we had to respond to it. And, and really at the beginning of the pandemic, to not have a health system that would collapse was the objective. So um, if you think at the time what we had, what we knew about pandemics was really what our experience was over the last uh, three, four hundred years and uh, maybe thousands of years in some sense. But um, thanks, uh, Sabrina, for remember reminding us how severe the plague was in the 13th, 14th century. Uh, but here we are just looking at the last hundred years and all we could remember was influenza. And all the pandemic's plans were about flu and about this uh, inspired by Spanish flu that Peter, Peter was just talking about in 1918, where in today's population, this is different from what you were talking about, in today's population, maybe 75 million people would have died from a virus that was transferred directly from a bird. And then we had two moderate pandemics in 57 and 68. And then we started having these threats of coronaviruses uh, starting with SARS in 2003 and culminating really in the 2019 experience with COVID uh, where in, in counted laboratory confirmed deaths, we are at uh, seven, eight million. But if you if you compute excess deaths the way that uh, Peter was just doing for 1918, you would see that probably 20 million people around the world have died with this pandemic. And what I want to take for you to take away from this is, well, it can happen. It will happen again and again. Pandemics are here to, to stay. They'll come again. We call the next one a uh, severe one, the future disease X, in which we really have a, a population changing, uh, horrifying events uh, like, like the one in 1918 or 2019. And another really more upbeat uh, take home message is that we know from these pandemics that there will be some waves that have some few years will pass and then it'll come to an end and possibly end up with a winter endemicity uh, at the end of the day. So uh, this is uh, how I went into this as a, I became Corona loaner of Denmark trying to um, help the government and the health authorities to understand what was going on and how we should respond. 
One thing that happened very early was that the, all data from anywhere you looked from for both from China and Italy early on would show us that old age was a big risk factor. And this was quite different different from historical pandemics where, for example, in 1920, it was the young adults that died the most. So this here is a, is a new way of seeing a pandemic. And really, if you think about it, made they the particular threat to European, uh, the European Union and countries here that have an aging population. But when people say, oh, you should just have put the old people away while we uh, suffered through the pandemic and everything would have been fine. This simply is not true. If you look at data from the uh, on mild illness and hospitalizations, you will see that the age is scooted so that if the average of uh, age at death was 80, the average age at hospitalizations was 65 and the average age at mild illness would be around 40 in Danish data. So really, even if you kept all the, the 80 years old out of this equation, even the 70 year olds, you still would have had overwhelmed hospitals uh, if you let the epidemic go. So what we did was uh, uh, start off with these lockdowns, which was really very medieval, if you think about it. It was not something we thought we would do when we went into the pandemic. And, and uh, it was like, uh, we called it in Danish, uh, maybe also in English, many small streams make a big river, a big river. You try to roll out everything we can do, which additively adds to our ability to control the epidemic. And much to our surprise, all this, it worked really well. We could, was actually able to, we had like got a little dial, we could dial up and down for this pandemic. This is unheard of. We never done anything like this for any pandemic in history. Uh, so, so, so this was really a game changer to think, well, we can control this. If we're willing to suffer these uh, lockdowns and pay all the money it costs, we actually I haven't had a chance to wait for the vaccine without uh, getting the health system or a lot of illness in the process. Uh, here's how it went in Denmark, um, where we did this very well. Only 10% of Danes were ever infected before the vaccines came. And when the vaccines came, 96% of adult Danes went to get their shot as soon as they could get it. So the effect was that you had maybe only 10% of Danes that ever had the uh, disease uh, naturally without, uh, I mean, meeting the disease before having protection from the vaccine. And immediately after, when everybody was vaccinated, the country opened up to uh, Omicron. I think we were one of the first countries to open up and, and all the Danes got it in two months. This is not surprising really if you think about it from models, but uh, so to some people maybe it was a surprise that epidemics will do this. They will. Um, and because of the vaccine protection, we really had taken the teeth out of this and, and, and you didn't have the, the big uh, trouble in, in terms of hospitalizations and deaths as was experienced in Italy. And this is another lesson that we learned across Europe was that not all European countries fared equally, even though we all had access to the same vaccines. So if you look at this uh, graph that I, comes from actually a, pro, uh, a work by Kalinsky and Kobach on, uh, on excess mortality, a paper in, li in eLife in 2021, uh, you can see that if you just uh, on the axis uh, go across time and look at how many people died in various countries due to coronavirus, about 1% of people in Bulgaria and almost nearly as many in many other Eastern European countries died in excess because of this pandemic. And this is really showing us what the potential could have been if we hadn't had very good epidemic control and, uh, and excellent vaccine countries in, uh, vaccine coverage in countries like Denmark, Sweden, Norway, uh, all kinds of places. And, uh, and, and Italy and the United Kingdom is somewhere along with the US in the middle. But really the trick is two things, that manage the control out so the vaccine came and then get the vaccine. And you can see that there's a very big difference across Europe. And this is some a really a lesson to take with us. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. In, it has everything to do with the uh, misinformation, mistrust, uh, concern about the vaccine. And again, for us historians of pandemics, this is also not a surprise. This has existed back to the smallpox vaccine. And for in, in all times, this is not a surprise that there will be misinformation and mistrust. But how can we manage it better becomes an important question. So this is really uh, the lesson learned from the COVID 2019 pandemic. 2000, yeah, is that it was a hundred years event. You can't get around that. 
and Italy shows this, New York City shows this, uh, many cities that got it on the nose before the vaccine will show us this, and Bulgaria showed it because they um, ended up the way they did at 1% of mortality, that uh, EU was at a particular risk of disaster because we had an aging population, and not only that, we had low test capacity, and we had low uh, ability to protect our uh, hospital care personnel, and that really was a really bad way of meeting a pandemic. I hope we can do better next time. I'm not so sure. I think we are on to the next uh, disaster already. This is my feeling, looking at the, where the money goes now and how we are thinking about it. The, the fact that this pandemic was controllable was is an interesting lesson that needs to be studied more. There, it was expensive, it was painful, but it was possible. Imagine that, and now we really, it's time to take all the country's experiences and try to identify the key elements of the lockdowns that worked so we can uh, drop the rest, because that's, that was very medieval what we had to go through there. Um, the vaccines, we were so lucky to have an effective vaccine in about 80 months into the pandemic, and we were lucky that EU could secure early and equal uh, and access to all the countries in Europe, but we can't really count on this another time. This was really lucky uh, in, in so many ways that we had this. And this is a key resource because if you really want to protect people from, from uh, getting severe COVID, this is the way to do it in the, in the uh, absence of, of better treatments and everything. But this is the, this is not itself. My, my point here is it's not itself not, not to, it's not enough to have the solution. You also ha have to make people want the solution and understand. We need to understand how to overcome this misinformation, mistrust. And this is my message to you, social science people, social science to the rescue here. If you want to understand how we can uh, communicate better and, and make better uh, uh, democracy in the context of a disaster like this, we need social science to the rescue. And also, uh, finally, for the EU, since this is a European meeting, it's really important to look at how it is how it came to be that Eastern Europe fared so poorly compared to uh, areas like Scandinavia. This is something to look into, so that it never happens again. This was it was not needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lone. That's fascinating. <laughs> A wonderful, a wonderful insight. Time is ticking here, and I, I'm, I'm anxious for John to have his turn at the podium also. But I must ask you, I given what you've said, mm -hmm. are you overall, given the technological and the uh, microbiological understanding that we have developed, and given our recent experience, do you think that you are broadly optimistic or pessimistic in regards to a future pandemic? Uh, well, I'm optimistic with the respects to we do have more, more and more uh, and faster and highly effective vaccine platforms now that we didn't have before this pandemic. This is the solution. This is good. But I have to say that I'm worried about, for example, bird flu right now uh, spreading a new clade of H5 and one being everywhere. And, and because that's a, a disease that wouldn't be stoppable the same way as COVID because it is more, much more democratic. Everybody infects about the same. You can't stop it the same way with the lockdowns or with not as effectively at least. So I'm, I'm looking at really, we were very lucky in this pandemic. We could easily have a worse one. And I see that we're not really taking the lessons that I thought we would. How, how really how are we going to be updating our pandemic plans and really take the lessons learned and and uh, and and get better in the future? I I would challenge everyone to to remind each other. Let's not forget this. This was a big one, and we uh, we avoided a lot of the disaster because of the way we handled it. But we might not be as lucky next time. Thank you, Lone. It reminds me of the takeaway comment from the first session of Eskida last year when the colleague who was speaking said, the lesson learned from COVID-19 is that we don't really learn lessons. And I think that's quite a worrying <laughs> that's thought right, in relation my, to what my, you've just my, been saying. My feeling too, yes. Thanks very Amazingly. much, Lone. Now, John, I'm so sorry about the time, but you have the floor, please. You're welcome. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. One, one very curious characteristic of epidemic intelligence is that we are always running against the clock. So this is not going to be an exception. <laughs> we have barely four minutes to do this presentation. So let's uh, get started with one question. How many of you do you know about epidemic intelligence? Can you raise your hand? Okay, that's exactly the reason why we are here. 
No one knows about the history of epidemic intelligence, or nearly no one. That is one of the main reasons that pushed us to check what is um, the background of epidemic intelligence, that usually the background is only one slide in any presentation, but in this presentation, the background will be everything, all the seven slides. Uh, we also need to think, what do we understand about epidemic intelligence when we check these seven slides, one, six, without taking into account this one? It's a systematic collection of information regarding outbreaks of infection diseases for early warning of communicable disease control purposes. So that will be the scope that we will have when we go through these slides. And also, this uh, knowing the history will provide us context about the meaning of epidemic intelligence, which is, uh, unfortunately, today very unknown. We will start a little bit with the ancient world. In the ancient world, um, we didn't, found, uh, we didn't uh, find any uh, concrete activity about epidemic intelligence. However, it is very worth to think that do that the information at that point was moving through, me through merchants, uh, through military convoys, and also with the church. Uh, there might be the possibility that information regarding outbreaks was collected by these people and somehow also collated by the um, intelligence services that they were at that uh, age. If we move now uh, very quickly to the um, plague centuries in Italy, this is the first time that we can observe that it is indeed a systematic collection of information in order to early detect what is going on in other countries or within also the uh, Italian regions. And this, is, uh, this was managed by what is called the health boards, and they were working in what they called, or they described, two axes, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. The horizontal axis was among the health boards themselves in the different Italian regions and the different autonomous cities, and the uh, horizontal one uh, was especially done to uh, informants and spies that they were sent to other countries and also they were collecting information through embassies. And this is the first time that we can see an um, organized activity or a proto-epidemic intelligence activity type. Then we move a little bit more to the future and we land uh, into the League of Nations, not the League of Legends, and the epidemic intelligence service that they, they uh, created at that time. What is interesting about this period? This is the first time that we have found that uh, we, uh, it was observed in the, in the literature uh, the term of epidemic intelligence. And concretely, it was done in a report that is this one that was published in the 14th January 1922. So we can say that the previous year was the first centenary of the epidemic intelligence, even though I am quite sure that you didn't uh, see any kind of publication or nothing related to that. But maybe in the second centenary we can do it. And what is special about this period? Apart that this is the first time that the concept appeared in a publication, uh, it's also a more structured uh, way of performing epidemic intelligence activities, and here it comes the technology component. They were mainly uh, relying on the telegraph and other kind of um, devices to uh, collect and collate and put everything in order to produce the reports. These reports were mainly uh, weekly reports, and also they were doing annual statistics. So what can we check about these three periods that we have seen. There, there are, of course, the history of epidemic intelligence, it's much broader, that we can also mention the US CDC and other, um, the international health regulations and any other activity that is going on and probably a lot of activities that we don't know about, that probably they happened in other continents, like for example, Africa, Asia. We don't know about that, but we know about these ones. What can we see in this period? We can see that the epidemic intelligence uh, has evolved uh, from different models. In some of these models, as we can see, there were just human activities or human sources. Then it moved to a more uh, technological component, mainly gathering information from open sources. And we are now in this new uh, technology predominant open source uh, approach uh, that we live uh, nowadays. And I'm over time now. Um, um, so what were a little bit of the impact of the COVID pandemic on epidemic intelligence? Well, uh, the paradigm here swift a little bit from um, detection to collection. So it was mainly a collection activities that they were done.
and this um, was especially um, related to the information overload and there was a reorganization of all the activities and especially here automat automat autom automation pl played a very uh, important role. What are the future challenges? Well, there are a lot of challenges for epidemic intelligence in the next decades. Uh, one is adapting and including new technologies, like for example, artificial intelligence, uh, also uh, evolved from the uh, human health to the one health perspective. And finally, that is mainly the most important one, is um, we don't have a common uh, ground here to talk about. We don't have a common terminology. We don't have university level courses. We don't have masters. We don't even knew about our history until someone did this. So we have a lot of activities to do still. And here it comes, the WHO pandemic and epidemic uh, intelligence hub, the Robert Koch Institute and ECDC, and also another organization, Africa CDC, that they are participating in order to bring us this common room so we can build together better epidemic intelligence activities and the core theory and knowledge. So the next 14th of January of the next year, remember that we will be celebrating the 102 years of epidemic intelligence. Hope that you can share any kind of photograph or any hashtag on X for you or those that you are working on epidemic intelligence. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Just a, a quick question for you. I know time is up. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, it's fascinating and very enlightening to hear how, how really how far we've come and how especially in the last hundred years, things have developed so much. Question to you about artificial intelligence. You say, I think th th your, your comment there is that it has the potential to do a lot of work, but the human element is still necessary um, to sort of formulate and understand it. But do you see any risks associated with AI in the EI? Hello, hello. Um, well, maybe there might be risks. Uh, it comes to my mind what um, it's also happening in other fields, like for example in radiology, that even more and more artificial intelligence might be taking um, place. Um, but well, maybe more than risk, we can see it also as, as uh, challenges or opportunities, opportunities maybe. At, for epidemic intelligence, um, artificial intelligence will increase a lot the capacity of every team to work better to, in order to detect threats. In concretely to artificial intelligence, in the in the ECDC group, there is one person that is Laura Espinosa that is developing a lot of activities on this. And I don't know if we can, but I believe Laura is here in the room if she wants to add something or inviting her. Would you like to add something, Laura? Please come on up. Thank you. So another characteristic of AI that we are always put on the spot and we know how to do it. So thanks, John. No, I think that with the uh, AI, John really mentioned really nice, you know, we need to ensure that there's still some human involvement because that's the most important thing. There are risks everywhere we go. If I tell you a document is done only by one person, everyone will say that doesn't look good. We need to have more experts involved. So a similar thing. And the main important aspect here is that we need to ensure to get some we were talking about training, train the experts so they know what type of technology they're working with so they can also prevent better the risks that may come along with that. So I think, as John said, it's more of an opportunity. There will always be risk in everything we do. We need to ensure that we know what we're doing and we don't forget the human component because that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That's a great point. So everybody, thank you for your patience in, in bearing with us for just a few more minutes. I think it's really valuable to have a moment to reflect on a great historical arc going all the way back six, seven hundred years to the Great Plague up until today. We've obviously come a very, very long way, um, but it's also equally obvious that we still have a long way to go and we have great threats standing above us. Let's just hope that AI in combination with very good human uh, insights and Thank you, Lona, in, in, in also in uh, including the social science capacity to deal with, address uh, misinformation and issues of, of, uh, of uh, health literacy and so on. Hopefully, next time, when it happens, we'll be better equipped and we can minimize mortality. So thank you so much for your time and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.